Uh, this morning I'd like to talk about nine killers. Um, nine killers. How to know that you're dying spiritually. Um, a lot of us, a lot of times, we uh, um, end up getting into a, a point in our lives where, where instead of moving forward, we're moving backwards. I heard it one time said that if you're not moving forward, you're backsliding. Even if you think you're standing still in the same place, you, you, we ought to always be moving forward. Amen. And, and listen, I'm not standing up here this morning saying you will always be moving forward. Um, we're human. We all have our issues and we all have situations that happen in our lives. And, and sometimes we feel like all, all we can do is tie a knot on the end of the rope and hold on. But the truth of the matter is we need to understand that there are signs of our spiritual life heading in the wrong direction instead of heading in the direction that we ought to be going. And so um, there are nine different ones. I'm sure there's a lot more than that. Um, but these are nine that I would just like to bring out this morning and, um, and share with you. So the first one of them is the story of the cross no longer moves you. The story of the cross no longer moves you. And, and we need to realize that there are times in our lives in which, in our spiritual life, in which if we're not careful, the story of the cross ends up being just a story. It becomes something that just... Well, I've read about this, I've heard about this since I was in Sunday school, and it really, yeah, I know it's supposed to have happened, but you know what I'm saying? It, it, it becomes, in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 12, it says, And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. And so as you begin to realize, you, you come to church and, and then the message no longer cuts at your heart. You, you hear about the crucifixion and maybe you yawn. You, it, it's, it's just become another story that you've heard forever and ever and ever. We need to realize that as we grow, there are things in our lives that cannot be whitewashed or just covered up or just have said okay that happened let's move on you know there are in, in the church in Ohio I used to say it a whole lot more because I knew a lot of these people and and so I would around Christmas and Easter I would literally get up in the pulpit and I would say it's so good to see our CEOs here today and what I was saying was those that come at Christmas and Easter only. CEOs, Christmas and Easter only. And there are a lot of people that are that way. You know, and then I exp explained to them that we had church every Sunday and we would love to see them every Sunday. But there comes a point in our lives where if we're not careful, we can get to the point where the story of the cross no longer moves us. We can, we can just not really be moved by it, and it just becomes another story. The second sign or the second thing would be you have lost your first love. Your hearts become cold. How many of you remember the day God filled you with the Holy Ghost? How many of you remember what, how, how excited you were and how how wonderful it felt and, and how beautiful and how clean you felt. And, and there was something about it that, that just, there was a fire that burned inside of you. Revelations chapter 2, verses 4 and 5 says, Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the, work, the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. 
You find yourself saying the words about a new convert who is on fire for God, and, and the words you're saying are, give it time, it'll pass. My prayer to God is that we would never, A, say those words, and B, never live those words. I don't ever want to live in a point in my life where it will pass. I want to be as on fire for God now as I was on the day that he filled me with the Holy Ghost. In fact, I want to be on fire more today than I did then. You know, yeah, 48 years have passed since I got the Holy Ghost. And if I was still in the same place I was 48 years ago, I would be in trouble. Spiritually, I would consider myself in trouble. We need to have that, that, that first love experience daily. You know, there was a time, now it's been, ooh, seven years ago. Coming up on seven years ago that I met my wife for the first time. And I remember, you know, just, all, if you all don't know this, I'm just going to give you this much of it. We met on eHarmony. Okay? And, and God blessed me with a wonderful wife through this. But I remember our dating time. I remember just how I felt when she would call or we would text each other, or whatever. There was that excitement that would, would flare up. And she still gives me butterflies. I still love my wife. A year later, we were married, and this year will be six years that she has put up with me. Amen. And where I, I told her I'll take her places, and I have. I've taken her to the grocery store and to the you know, hardware store. And, no, I'm just kidding. But anyhow, so, you know, it, it, it would, I would be a little worried if that first love that I had for my wife has become secondary or third or fourth down the row, or maybe not even hitting my top ten. You see, that's what ends up happening in, in marriages and divorces and everything else. One or both begin to look in the opposite directions. Let me explain something to you. God will never look in the opposite direction from you. So if there's going to become a distance between you and God, guess who's moving? It's not God. God is always going to try to move towards you and not away from you. So we need to understand that we need to Seek after God and, and desiring God and, and making sure that we have that first love and not allow our first love, as it says there in, in uh, Revelations 2, 4, nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Now, that's pretty strong words. God says, I have this against you. So it's not a light thing for us to walk away from our first love of Christ. We need to make sure that we stay on fire for him. This is that, that, that place where you no longer feel that burning fire in your soul to get closer to God. And, you, and, and, you know, there, there's an old saying, and, well, I'll, I'll use that maybe later in another one. Number three, you're fooling yourself. I don't, yeah, you're, you're, you're fooling yourself. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 18 through 20, let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness. Foolishness with God, for it is written, he catches the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. Amen. They are futile. So we, we begin to think that we're wise. 
We begin to think that we've got it all under control. I know what's going on. I know I don't need. And, and we begin to get that, that point where, you know, Satan, you see, can blind us and, and make us to think that just doing the minimum is enough. If you have, in your life, you can do the minimum and get through life. But you're not going to, A, enjoy life. And B, you're not going to be real healthy. If I just get up in the morning, walk into the kitchen and, and have a little bowl of, of Cheerios. Well, I was, I was trying to go for the more unhealthy, you know, Fruit Loops or, you know, something that's loaded with sugar, which is what I would want. <laughs> I like the sugar and I'm working on that. Amen. Working on getting away from that. All right. But if I do that and then I just, you know, drag myself into work and, and put in my minimum, I put in my time, I punch the clock, and then go about my day doing as little as I possibly can. Then I drag myself home, maybe eat some kind of a, a lunch that's not very healthy, and then I get home at night and I eat some unhealthy you know, meal at night, and then I go to bed, sit there and maybe watch TV for the next six hours before I climb in bed, saying, God, I really wish I would have had time to spend more time with you. You can get through life doing that. But you're not going to be real healthy. You know, if we allow ourselves to listen to the voices that Satan would love to play in your mind, and we allow him to begin to flare those things up in us, we begin to fall backwards and, and we begin to, to find that, that we're, we're fooling ourselves and believing that we're living when we're really not. There is so much to life that we can live if we surpass those obstacles that seem to be put up in our, our, our road, that seem to try to hold us back, but a lot of times they're just there to make us stronger. I had a bodybuilder in my church in Ohio that, I mean, he just, but he also told me, it's no pain, no gain. We've all heard it. You have to, you know, you have to have that struggle sometimes. You know, if you, do you realize that if, if you have a cocoon, and you see that cocoon and, and the butterfly is starting to come out. It's trying to break its way out. Do you realize that if you were to take a razor knife and, and carefully slit that cocoon and open it up to allow that butterfly out, that butterfly will never fly? You think you've done it something good because you've made it easier, but it takes that struggle for that butterfly to build the muscles, to build its endurance, to do and to be able to get out and actually fly. So how often is it that we look for that easy way out, and in all reality, it's taking us in the wrong direction? Hosea chapter 11 and verse 7 says, My people are bent on backsliding from me, though they call to the Most High, none at all exalt him. My people are bent on backsliding from me. They, they're, they're just determined that I'm not going to get closer to God. I just as soon stay back here and, and sit in the back. You know, I'm kind of embarrassed to say this, but I went to three years of college to be, a, you know, to study the, to the, study the, the word of God and, and to become a preacher. And in three years of college, three years of speech class, I never got up and gave one speech. And how I passed it, I don't know. You see, because I was one of those that I would rather sit in the back. I didn't want to be here. I really didn't. I didn't want to be 
in, in, in this place. I'm sorry, but I'm getting hot up here. So we're going to turn on the fan. I, I, I didn't want to, to, to be in the, the spotlight. I know a lot of people think I like that, but I have to work at that. And a lot of times it's just because of who I am. And so we need to understand if we are not moving forward, we're backsliding. And, and, and here in Hosea 11, 7, my people are bent on backsliding from me. Oh God, let me not be that person. Let me be bent on getting closer to you. Number four, the church services bore you. The church services bore you. Baby, I'm bored. You know, not baby on board, baby I'm bored. We need to understand that Romans chapter 10 and verse 17 says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And where do you hear that? You come to church and you become a part of the, the work of God. And, and you don't separate yourself from it. Do you find yourself showing up for church just because it's Sunday or because that's what others are expecting of you? It's okay to be fishing and thinking about church service, but it's not okay to be in church service thinking about fishing. When we're here, where is my mind? Am I thinking about things outside? Am I thinking about some television program I'm wanting to watch when I go home? Am I thinking about the game today? I didn't even know there was some special game today. My son informed me this morning when I was FaceTiming him and my granddaughter that there's a special game that the Cleveland Browns are playing in today and and how great they did last week and all that kind of stuff. You know, some people might be sitting in the house of God thinking about a football game instead of thinking about God and worshiping God. What is the reason that we've come here? Our minds will wander at times, but we must focus on why we are really here. Why am I here? I want to be in this place today. I don't want to come in here and, and sit on the pew or in the chairs and, and, and just go through the, the, the calisthenics of being in church. I don't want to just, you know, clap my hands when they sing, you know, and, and maybe raise my hands once or twice when I, I feel a little tinge on my, I run up and down my, my backbone. And then go home and have received absolutely nothing from my experience. This is a place we ought to draw closer to him. We ought to draw closer to him in our prayer lives, in our Bible reading, even at home. But this is a place, you know, this is a hospital for sinners. This is a place that we come to be encouraged, our, our, our brothers and our sisters. I remember when I was a child in this building... Almost every service, we had testimony service. And we slowly have worked away from those things. But I remember hearing different ones would stand and say, I thank God for what he's done for me this week. I was going through this struggle, but God supported me. God lifted me up. God brought me through it. And by me hearing them say it, I realized he will do the same for me. And so we need to come to this place. We need to begin to say, God, what is it that you have for me? And, and what is it, God, that, that you want to do in my life? God, because I want to get closer to you. I don't want to get further from you, and God, I don't want to come in here with an I'm bored attitude. If we're bored, look at yourself. You know, I, I've heard many people say, well, I don't like going there because I, 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 I don't get fed. I don't, I, I've, I've never heard anybody go into a restaurant, into a big buffet, 
sit down at a table and then get up and leave and say, I don't like that restaurant because I never got fed. How do you get fed? You take the fork. You put the fork in your hand. You dig it in and you put it in your mouth. The restaurant provides the food. Your wife provides the food. Or, or you buy it, she cooks it, you cook it, whoever, however. You know, the food is there. But you don't get fed until you personally do it. Now, I understand there are some people, my mother at the end, toward the end of her life, we almost had to feed her. But you see, the fact of the matter is if you're going to grow, You've got to learn to feed yourself. As a minister of the gospel, I can do only so much. I can present the word of God to you. I can give it to you. I can preach it. But unless you take it into yourself, it's not going to feed you. So if you're saying, I, I'm, I'm bored, you need to get into it and get into the word and begin to desire the sweet milk of the word and desire for God to move in your life. Number five, failing to do what you, you know you should do. I do understand, I just don't care. Failing to do what you know you should do. James chapter 1, verses 19 through 27. So then, my beloved brother, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. In other words, feed yourself. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in the mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of a man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. If anyone among you thinks he is religious, and does not bridle his tongue, he deceives his own heart. This one's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. James chapter 4 and verse 17, Therefore to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him... It is sin. We have all been given a ministry. Every one of us. It may not be a pulpit ministry. You may not have been called to preach from a pulpit to a big congregation. But you've been given a ministry to do. God expects for us to do the work for him. You all will meet people that I may never meet. You work with people that I may never work with. God will put people in your path. God put Brother Demetrius in my path one day when I was working at the library. And we got talking and, and, and we got kind of working together per se. But through that, none of you may have known Demetrius. Some of you might have. But you see, what ends up happening is because I opened up and he opened up and, and we began to talk, we were, be, we were able to, you know, build that relationship more. And, and now Demetrius and now Jamie are here because of a relationship that I had with Demetrius. You see, each and every one of us, God puts somebody in your life that he expects you to reach. I don't care if it's your mailman. I don't care if it's if it's the 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 attendant at the gas station or or if it's the woman that's checking out your groceries or whoever it might be. God puts people in our lives and we need to stop walking around the neck 
case, I, I've talked about wearing blinders, but in that case, we need to remove the blinders and say, God, who do you have for me today? And I believe that if we pray and seek God, he will let us know what he wants for us to do and who it is that he wants for us to reach. Because in that and through that, he will give us exactly what we need. Number six, we have no interest in seeing souls saved. I don't feel, and neither do I care to. How many people have that kind of an attitude? I don't feel, and neither do I care to. That's apathy. We, we need to understand that we need to care. We need to be concerned about others. And it's not something that's just, okay, I repented, I was baptized in Jesus' name, I was filled with the Holy Ghost, now all I have to do is show up on Sunday morning and sit there and I don't have to share Jesus with anybody. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30 says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who wins souls is wise. We need to, and, and, and I, I strongly, I strongly believe this. I do not believe God is going to put somebody in your path and tell you to reach them, and you're not able to actually reach them. He will link you up with people of a same intelligence level and a same outlook on, on just life per se. He's going to link you up so that you can reach out to these people. Pastor Aaron Soto, he pastors here in, in Wisconsin, said this, Evangelism is not a ministry. Evangelism is not a gift. Evangelism is a decision. The bottom line about evangelism is this. If God died for everyone, everywhere, then you should witness to everyone everywhere. Did you hear that? Evangelism is not a ministry. Evangelism is not a gift. Evangelism is a decision. You need to decide. When you're getting ready to leave the house in the morning, I am looking for that person that God is going to put in my path today that I can witness to them. And I'm not saying every person you rub elbows with is going to be that person. Because there will be people that are very closed off and they don't want to hear a thing you have to say. But there is going to be somebody that God is moving in their life and he's going to let your paths cross and you're going to say something or they're going to say something and, and it's going to just draw you together and you're going to be able to share Jesus with them. The bottom line about evangelism is this. If God died for everyone everywhere, then you should witness to everyone everywhere. It ought to be your heart's cry, your heart's desire, and that calling in your life to reach others. Mark chapter 16 and verse 15. It says, And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And in this day and age, there's a lot of people that we look at and go, that's a creature. But you see, God wants us to reach out to others. Amen? Number seven, frequent absences of worship services. I don't know if you can read that. The sheep's walking away saying, fooey on them, I can do just as well on my own. And hiding behind the rock where he's heading is a wolf. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23 through 25. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. And church, I'm going to tell you something. I see the day approaching. 
You know, I, I do believe what we are starting to see here in the States is things that other countries have been seeing for you. And I think we have kind of a spoiled North American mindset to think that this should never happen to us. But the fact of the matter, if it's happening somewhere else, it can happen here. Okay? So we need to understand and prepare for all that. But we need to get ourselves closer to him, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. And I know last year, COVID hit. And so far, as far as I understand, COVID's still an issue in 2021. I thank God to see each and every one of you here. And later on, if you're watching this message on YouTube, if Sister Ginger posts it, you know, we need to understand that our God is bigger than COVID. Our God is stronger and bigger than COVID. He's stronger than any pandemic, greater than any pandemic, and we need to search and seek God and desire the things of God. And I encourage people, be in the house of God. If you feel you need to wear a mask, I see some here this morning are wearing their mask. That's fine. But be in the house of God with your brothers and sisters. You know, it's just like the old coal that gets pulled away from the fire. Eventually it goes out. It can be sitting right next to the fire. And there are people that they have no choice. They can't get out. And so therefore they do get, I, I remember a video that I saw of one of my uncles. Had Alzheimer's. He was sitting in his chair. And his hands were in the air. And for over an hour, I saw a couple minutes, three to five minute clip, and my cousin posted, he's been doing this now for over a half an hour. And later we found out he continued for over another half hour. He's just sitting there worshiping and praising God. He couldn't really get out and get to church and whatnot, but he still had that desire. He was watching a message or something on, you know, they, that they had brought in so that he could see the service. But, and, and he didn't understand. You know, he didn't know his children. He didn't know, you know, who, who he was. He didn't know any of that. But one thing was ingrained in him was the love of God. And, and there was something about it. Even my, my mother was the same way. She, when, when people would come, if they said something, she wanted to pray for them. You see, that is where it comes from. Number eight, worldly things attract you more than spiritual things. Worldly things attract you more than spiritual things. Where is our focus? The little girl there, she's focusing on her little teddy bear. But I love it, God. I don't want to give it up. I can't give it up. God, will you please? You know, I, I, I you know, because our eyes are on the the worldly things, and here, here Jesus is saying, just trust me. And behind him, he's got a teddy bear that's ten times as big. You see, we need to understand that when we focus on the wrong things, we're not going to grow spiritually. We need to understand that, that we, we need to get our eyes off of the worldly and onto the spiritual. Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 8. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. We need to understand 
that we cannot put our focus on the worldly things, even if I'm coming to church. I come to church every Sunday. But my mind is constantly on the worldly. How much am I going to get here? Because as we've talked already, our, our, our focus, even while we're in the house of God, we're thinking about fishing instead of about the word that's going forth. And number nine, no participation in the work of the church. Nobody is too busy, it's just a matter of priority. Nobody's too busy. It's just a matter of priority. You see, we can get our priorities all mixed up. I have to do this. I have to do that. Church becomes secondary, maybe third or fourth down the list. Because all these other things are more important. Really? How much are these things over here going to do for your spiritual and your eternal life compared to coming into the house of God and seeking to work for God and desiring to do the work of God. Romans chapter 10 verses 1 through 3. Brother, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Verse 3, for they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. If all you're looking to do is the things of the world, you're never going to be able to grow in God. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 30, he who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. We need to realize that God has something for us to do. We need to understand that, that our spiritual life in Christ is the most important thing. It's, it's not secondary to our jobs. It's not secondary to our house, our family, our kids. It ought to be number one. If you believe that your family is important, which I do. If your family is important, then the one thing that should be more important is God. Because you cannot be the husband, the wife, the brother, the sister, the aunt, the uncle, the grandparent that you ought to be unless God is number one in your life. We need as children of God to begin to put our priorities right and put our priorities where they ought to be in our focus in our lives. And these nine steps, you know, we ought to do everything that we can to reverse what, what it would be to cause us to come down and make it, those are the areas where we begin to grow. In conclusion, let's uh, look at the, the final of days of Jesus uh, before Jesus was uh, crucified. In an excerpt from Uninvited by Lisa Turkhurst, it says this, Though Jesus had some of his disciples close by, he knew that he was utterly alone. Alone in his understanding of the seriousness of the night. Alone in his pain. Alone in his assignment. Jesus said to Peter, James, and John in Mark 14, 34, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch. And his only companions fell asleep. Going a little further, he fell down on the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Mark chapter 14, verse 35 and 36. And right there at this point, at which Jesus, it's right here at this point, where Jesus could have run. He stared at what it meant to press through the events of the cross, and every bit of his humanity cried out, Take this cup from me. Every bit of his humanity. An interesting fact about the Garden of Gethsemane is that it sits at the base of a known escape route 
from the city of the Mount of Olives toward the Judean desert. This is the route that David took when running from his son Absalom. Jesus would have known this fact and he could have taken it, but he didn't. But instead of running, she goes on to say, he turned to his father and said, nine hell-shattering, demon-shaking, devil-killing words. And that are, these are those. Yet not what I will, but what you will. Mark 14, 36. So as we just covered nine negative things, we need to put in our minds and our hearts exactly what Jesus said in the garden. Yet not my will, but what you will. God, let your will be the thing that drives me. Let your will be what gives me what I need to do. In Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Reasonable. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. You know, there are those people that show up to church on Sunday morning and you look at them and you think, man, they're, they got it all on the, on the ball. They're, they're godly, they're holy. They're, and then through the week, they don't look, act, or talk anything like it when they're not by the church. Sis, if you could put up that last slide. The days are evil. We need to dress appropriately. Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. And I don't know if it shows up on there, but he's got the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the sword of the spirit, the, the belt of truth, and, and the gospel of peace on his feet. We need to do this. This is the way we overcome the other nine. By getting dressed every morning. I heard someone this morning speaking. and They said every morning they get up, they have to intentionally get dressed. They have to intentionally put on their clothes. It's not like they get up and bing, it's all on, so now I can go on with my day. So if you have to do that in the physical realm, you're going to have to do that in the spiritual realm. You're going to have to pray on the helmet of salvation. You're going to have to pray on the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith. Take up the sword of the Spirit. Read it. Trust it. Get into it. Put on the belt of truth. God, I, I need your truth. I don't need to hear all the lies that are coming from out here. And trust me, there are so many lies that are going around out here. I don't care if you're Democrat. I don't care if you're Republican. There's, there, there, there's, there's lies coming from every angle. And we need to understand, God, I need your truth. I need to put your truth in my life. Let it change me, God. Let it make me who you want me to be. And let me do what you're calling me to. Put on the gospel of peace. God, let me everywhere I go, everywhere I put my feet, God, let it be bringing peace. When you walk into a room, do you bring peace into the room? Or do you just scatter and people are like, eh. Do you walk into a room and then walk out of the room? And it, when you walked in, it seemed to be kind of nice. But when you leave, it's nothing but chaos. We need to bring the gospel of peace.